<laughs> so I assume I can take it. Uh, yeah, so a little bit over. Let's just make sure that they can hear you, so. Yeah. If you can, if you can be heard, let me introduce you. Can you hear me? Uh, People online, can you hear Ted? Robert, I'll. Yeah. I'll yes. Okay, you want good. me to do the full intro? Or uh, yeah, or yeah, do, go do the whole thing. At least I'll, I'll introduce the, uh, well, let me start. Oh, no, so. let me start, let me give it to you. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Welcome everybody to Ted Malfan Yin's PhD Defense. It's uh, an amazing honor to be here. Um, I think it was, uh, we just confirmed that it was uh, about six years ago in the summer of 15 when this super bright-eyed kid showed up in my, in my lab and said, hey, I'm looking for a project and uh, he was part of a visiting group from Shanghai Jatong and, uh, and I thought, you know, these uh, Shanghai Jatong students are really, really bright. I'm going to give him something really hard and uh, let's see if he, has, if he manages to finish it. You know, we have three weeks, which was a lie in my own mind. I knew it even then that, that when he showed up, we had two and a half weeks. And uh, it's a three-week project, which was also a lie. It wasn't a three-week project. It was a little longer. And I thought, there's no way he's going to finish it. And I remember very well uh, as we sat in the lab with my students at the time, and one of them said, he's already done in a week afterwards. And so we had an extra two weeks and uh, uh, with at least the first part of the, the project that he started. And I thought, ah, oh, this is a really, really, really uh, bright, uh, bright student. And that was the beginning of a, of a long collaboration that uh, went everywhere and touched everything from the very lowest levels of storage systems all the way to uh, distributed coordination and consensus protocols. I'm really proud of it, especially one aspect of the work that we did, which I consider to be the latest, greatest step in the, uh, in the, in the series of, uh, of families uh, of uh, consensus protocols that have ever been invented. Um, so that's uh, my short introduction to, uh, to Ted and his accomplishments in the in the time that he uh, spent with us here at Cornell, and he's going to summarize the work that he did uh, very shortly. I also want to talk a little bit about my situation here. Um, I found that in the 50 years that I've been alive, that life comes at you in funny spurts when you least expect it. Things just happen and you have to react, and your reaction defines who you are. So you're driving down the highway and you see a car accident, you either press the brake and help, or you press the gas and say, that's not my problem. And uh, so one of the things that can happen, it turns out, is that your student can invent something really, really, really significant. And you can say, this is wonderful, we're going to work together, and we're going to make something awesome, even more awesome, out of this together. Or you can say, I will take this, and I will leave the student out to dry, so to speak. And uh, another option that uh, one has as an institution is when you see a student who might be in a vulnerable situation, as an institution, you can say, there is a situation here that needs to be managed. There is a situation here that needs to be addressed. No matter what we do on paper, there is a situation here that needs to be addressed and managed. Or you can say, you know what, on paper I'm going to separate myself. I'm going to abdicate my responsibility to manage this situation by making the student no longer the, the student of the professor with whom he worked so hard, with whom they, they built so many things. So, uh, so I, know, I know what I did, and I know what Cornell did. So I come to you today as a member of the audience. Ted is not officially my student, and uh, uh, he is actually Robert Van Rennesse's student, because Cornell has decided that the conflict created by having invented something so awesome um, caused us to, uh, to have to separate. Um, regardless, um, the time that I worked with him, we invented quite a few things and I'm very proud of the, the work we did. After that time, when he was officially working with Robert Van Der Nessi, I continued to talk to him, and uh, he has uh, put his name down on even more projects and on even more advances in the space of distributed systems. So uh, I'm really proud and honored to have worked with Ted, and uh, I would like to now turn it over to his official advisor <laughs> for the last few words. Okay, well, I'll just uh, go into a uh, few formalities. Uh, so. Uh, Ted will have about an hour to present uh, the work that he's done over the last year, which is considerable. Uh, he won't cover all of it, obviously, uh, in detail, but, uh, uh, and I don't know how he's going to present it because it's, it's our tradition 
that uh, the PhD student uh, does the, the, the preparation himself. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll be hopefully, uh, I'll, I'll be mostly just as surprised as you guys are to see what, uh, where this is going today. Uh, during the talk, uh, you can certainly ask uh, if there are clarifications needed, you know, feel free to speak up. Uh, if you have deeper questions, please hold those uh, till the end, uh, where we can certainly have some time for discussion, hopefully. And then after an hour, uh, we are going to uh, reduce uh, this gathering uh, to uh, officially, it's the, the people who are in the graduate field of computer science, which includes Gun and Bobby, and, uh, but today I'll, uh, I might get into trouble for this. I'll, Dalia, if you want to stay, I'd be happy if you, if you did. Uh, and any other um, members of the graduate field who may be online uh, are welcome to stay. And then we'll uh, grill the quartet a little bit more, and then uh, uh, we'll also uh, let Ted leave the room, and uh, let don't go too far when that, that happens, because hopefully we'll have you back in here fairly soon after that. But here are some good news, there's some bad news uh, that uh, still remains to be seen. Uh, and without further ado, Ted, you can take it from here. Thank you, Professor Gunzer and Professor Robert Vermines. So here we go, uh, the beginning of my talk, and we have uh, so much uh, content, uh, so many contents to cover, and so little time. So let's just get started. And I'll, I le already left all my words of gratitude to my dissertation. So take a look at that lengthy <laughs> acknowledgement to my dissertation. <clears throat> Maybe Hongbo, you can pull yeah. slide. Okay. Actually, can you do one thing and, and introduce your committee? Uh, sure. So, uh, my current committee uh, it consists of uh, Professor uh, Robert Van Rennes and my uh, external minor advisor, uh, Adrian Sampson, and my internal uh, advisor, Adrian is online, Robert uh, Kleinberg. Great. And, and of course, we have got two honorary members in the Gun and Dal. <laughs> okay. Okay. So during this one hour, I'm going to quickly, really quickly, go through three main projects that I've done throughout my PhD, and which could be divided mainly into two parts. And first part will be the you know, most lengthy part, because it includes two BFT state machine replication protocols, uh, namely Hostoff and Avalanche, followed by the final part, which talks about my recent adva advancement and attempt in making a better persistent key value stores. So before we dive right into the topic, let's spend a little bit more time to define the problem because we still need to know what we're really tackling with here. So state machine, Byzantine fault tolerance state machine replication, or in short BFT SMR or BFT state machine replication, uh, it's an equivalent problem to its uh, consensus counterpart. So you may, we have already heard of Byzantine fault tolerance consensus problem and they can convert to each other. So from now on, I just use the word replication and consensus in short to refer to them interchangeably. And when I say that, I just mean Byzantine fault tolerant as the environment for the network. So in such a problem, we have n nodes particip participating in a network where at most n nodes could exhibit arbitrary behavior. Here, arbitrary behavior means the nodes can send arbitrary messages to other correct nodes to try to overthrow the entire process. So this, this may sound different from the benign fault tolerant protocols like Paxos or Raft, where nodes can only crash. But noticeably, Byzantine nodes cannot interfere the inter-replica communication between correct nodes. And the objective in such a system is to make sure, for example, in this diagram, we have four nodes, and where one is uh, the Byzantine node. What we like to make sure here is, uh, despite of the existence of the Byzantine node, the rest of the network will still achieve agreement, eventually, upon the replicated log, or replicated operations that could be applied to an uh, internal state machine. In a more English term, it's like they are doing, eventually doing the same sequence of operations. So you have a consistent state across the rest of the network, given the presence of Byzantine nodes. And of course, this problem is unsolvable. It was shown in 
1983 by Fisher, Lynch, and Patterson that any protocol that satisfy the agreement property, which means the consistency or comp compatibility of the locks, uh, for any such protocol, there exists at least one non-terminating execution path. So to get around it, researcher had uh, thought about many ways to uh, by amending the pro uh, protocol model, by amending the network model, for example, you can assume the protocol only terminates probabilistically. It doesn't sound like a totally unrealistic protocol if the protocol terminates eventually with probability of one, probably after several rounds of iteration, the protocol still uh, reaches some agreement. And another way is to somewhat strengthen the network communication assumption. For example, we can assume any message across the network only takes up to some delta amount of time. So then we get synchronous model. And the most interesting thing is you can try to make a compromise between these two choices and finally have a protocol that's uh, regarded more practical, uh, which is a partially synchronous model. So under this model, protocols usually always got guarantee safety, no matter how asynchronous the network becomes, no matter how long the message is delivered, but it still terminates when the network gets stabilized and synchronized at the very end. Just we don't know when it gets stabilized and has the synchronous guarantee. And we are focused mostly on these two models, the asynchronous model and partial asynchronous models, because these are the uh, uh, common models chosen by the current uh, replication protocols. And a good example for asynchronous model is the protocol proposed by Ben Orr in 1983. It uses randomization to break, break a, uh, to break the symmetry in the network. Because imagine in a network you have different nodes. Each starts with a different value. And they execute the same copy of the algorithm then there has to be a way to finally collapse the value into one univalent value in order to make agreement. So the key insight here is the intro introduction, introduction of uh, random, randomness. And for a partially synchronous model, the way to break the symmetry, however, is to have a des designated leader. So we first give a specific replica a special role called leader or leadership then that node starts to dictate the network which uh, ever next proposal should be. And good example also includes protocols outside of BFT world. For example, those protocols that tolerate crash, uh, fault toler uh, crash failures such as Paxos and Rex. And for sure, these different models have different uh, properties or practicalness. Usually for asynchronous model because it progresses without the leader. Uh, in that case, everyone just proposes and with randomization, they finally reach agreement. And that means it typically takes more time to go through the entire process. And the, the best known result was uh, cubic amount, uh, amount of uh, message exchange in the network to reach a uh, consensus. Until recently, there's a work called Validated Asynchronous Byzantine Agreement paper published in POTSI 2019, uh, which is partially inspired by the first work we're gonna talk about. And as for partially synchronous model, uh, it does it in a very different way because we have a leader, so we have constant number of rounds on a good day. So when the network is synchronized, we have only one leader, the leader is non-faulty, then the leader can quickly uh, <clears throat> do the consensus in constant number of steps. But even on a good day, the quadratic cost, for example, by PBFT is still far from being uh, perfect compared to the benign competitors or counterparts like Paxos, because in Paxos, you only need to spend linear amount of message in the network to reach the consensus. And these protocols are usually uh, complicated and have subtle operational logic notoriously difficult to implement. The leader itself, uh, although it solves the problem, the contention problem, uh, that it may exist in the asynchronous model protocols, but the leader could itself become the new bottleneck. So here's a diagram showing the network communication pattern for PBFT as an example. But uh, many other quorum-based protocols that I just mentioned, in either model, 
uh, may exhibit similar communication paths or even more complicated paths than this. So we can see there, there is one to all broadcast and even all to all bro broadcast in this diagram. The x-axis is the time, either logical or in real time, while the y-axis is different uh, replicas or participants in the system. However, in 2008, someone named Satoshi Nakamoto proposed something called Bitcoin, and it doesn't even mention the word consensus in the paper. But what it actually does is quite similar. So it wants to make sure that eventually, across the entire network, some correct, all the correct nodes will roughly or probabilistically converge on the common prefix of a chain. So this is usually called blockchain. Uh, but in fact, this blockchain is not a chain structure. It's a tree structure. So what it does is we have a repeated mining process for each block where each block contains the hash value of the previous block, chaining the entire verifiable history of uh, all blocks. And the blocks carries payloads, like transactions. And the, the trick here is uh, we require each block to contain uh, proof of work. And since the proof of work is easy to verify, but hard, very hard to mine or construct, so the main chain, if we stipulate that everyone builds on the longest chain, the longest chain keeps getting longer, and under certain assumptions, the longest chain will finally be the common chain among the rest of the network. So it operates by a very different principle. So then, in our first work, we'd like to bridge the two different paradigms, basically. And by doing that, we would like a blockchain style kind of consensus, which is still problem based in Hostov. So in this work, we would like, a, uh, would like the protocol that still works on the blockchain kind of structure, where the history is immut immutable and verifiable. That means we need to make consensus on the prefix of the path over the chain. The path represents the trace of the underlying state machine replication. And furthermore, we also would like no special treatment of view change, because usually BFT quorum-based protocols requir uh, requires complicated view change subprotocol. And in the end, we managed to encode consensus knowledge entirely with onto the chain topology. And that actually gave us a lot of uh, freedom in designing the protocol and reason about its correctness, and also reducing its cost. We also solved an open problem that we can achieve linear cost in both optimistic case and view change case per linear failure uh, with responsiveness. So this part could be a little bit subtle. Uh, please refer to the dissertation for more discussion. And on that overview, the protocol operates like this. Compared to the previous all-to-all -all communication, we have an aggregator for each round. Or it's like for each phase, but implicitly within each block. And the leader could shift between different phases. And really, in our protocol, in our final protocol, there's no explicit definition for phases. Each block may represent a generic, generic phase. And here, each, each leader for that block or phase receives the votes for the previous phase and aggregate the votes into uh, a proof of 2f plus 1 votes to the next phase. And so the entire process could even be pipeline. And the protocol makes, uh, keeps track of three major state variables. BLOC uh, refers to the block leading the preferred branch. B execute, which refers to the last committed block, already may have already executed by the state machine. So the green part is the uh, confirmed or committed part. And V height is the height of the block this replica last voted for. So how does that preference thing work? Because I mentioned B lock. So there's a locking mechanism that a replica only tends to vote for a block on a more preferred branch, which is pretty similar to the uh, longest chain rule in Nakamoto consensus or in Bitcoin's consensus, but in a different way because we don't have proof of work. What we're, we're, what we are looking for right here is among all the blocks like B4, which gets 2f plus 1 votes, which, is a, which could be proved by a 
quorum certificate, or QC, if it gets two hops of QC, meaning in block B5, it carries a proof of majority votes for B4, and in turn, in block B6, it carries another proof of a majority votes for B5. Among all these blocks like B4, the highest block gets the preference, and it leads the, the, the branch of preference. Uh, this could be also interpreted in a way that it is the most recent block on the topology that made that has made through two phases of voting. So after we have the preference definition, uh, we can uh, <coughs> define our voting voting mechanism, and the voting mechanism is very uh, simple. And <coughs> for most of the time, you just vote, you just check whether the new block has higher block than the last block that you voted for. And in addition to that, you also check whether the new block is on the same branch as the locked block. There's also an exception case that could conditionally unlock the preference, uh, which is crucial for liveness, and also defer that to the dissertation. And the final question is, when do we commit? We have the voting mechanism, we know how to aggregate, we, we know how to put votes onto the block topology, by forming QCs, we know the preference, but when do we know we can actually adva advance the green part? Because the green part is the final, finalized part, or the output of the protocol. And this is surprisingly simple, because in our protocol, we do not need time-dependent information other than this topology. So by looking at the topology, for example, suppose B4 gets three hops of QCs. So I don't want to re repeat it, but you know, three rounds of majority votes, where the first two rounds, the first two halves, also point prove the direct parent. And in this case, we know for sure that you can advance the green part to B4. Then a question could be like, is it always guaranteed that your green part can reach that point? Uh, yes, it is guaranteed and it's, it's, it's proven in, in the paper. <coughs> So another question for this work is, uh, you seem to use two rounds of voting. You use uh, three rounds of voting, three QCs to commit. But in PBFT or in, like in, in, in Paxos or in other protocols, you only need two rounds. And the reason behind is, is very interesting. And of course, you can have a two-phase variant of hosta, but you may end up with some subtle liveness problem. And accordingly, you can amend the preference rule to have a two-phase version. And the two-phase version is deeply connected, connected to our related work, Tendermint. And again, refer to the paper, it's very interesting for this part. And I think it's also possible to design a two-phase protocol that you still have the standard liveness guarantee, uh, but by sacrificing the linear complexity. So the reason here, we maintain three phases for the final commitment. It's also partly because of the theoretical contribution. We like to make it linear. So what's the secret sauce? I dumped a bunch of things <laughs> in your head and they seem interesting and you know the overall structure, but why, does the, why, does this, why is this protocol special? Uh, what does it do to, to solve the problem? Well, if I only need uh, I can only say one thing about the protocol is it tries to keep time independent data structures. So unlike, unlike old protocols, uh, usually you, you have a, a bunch of state variables in a protocol. You have a map, you have an array, you have like ballot numbers for different parts, you have sequence numbers, you have a bunch of variables to keep track of, and the protocol just progresses in an intertwined space uh, space-time uh, diagram or timeline in it. So that makes the protocol difficult to anal uh, analyze and difficult to improve. But instead, in our work, we try to move over most of the consensus-related knowledge onto the chain itself. So now the chain itself becomes a space-time structure. So we, we can derive a lot of uh, useful information by purely looking at the topology of the chain. And that way, we only need to maintain three main variables that 
have a clear definition over time. <clears throat> Overall, the main contribution for Hasta theory-wise theory is that it is the first partially synchronous protocol that achieves linear lower bound in presence of a linear failure. And it also inspired other protocols such as uh, validated as asynchronous business agreement that I just talked about and synchronous hot stuff. So it, it also impacted the other, the design of the protocol in two other categories that we, we didn't talk about in this, uh, we won't talk about in this work. And engineering wise, the protocol safety is just about checking some conditions of the tree topology, which is very different from the uh, traditional quorum based protocols. And there's no e explicit view change handling for safety, so that the safety part could de be de decoupled from liveness. In our paper, we coined the concept called pacemaker. So, pacemaker decides when to create a block and when to elect a new leader, but However you design the pacemaker, it won't affect the safety of the protocol, as long as the basic assumptions are held. And the safety part could be made within 200 lines of C code, which is pretty short and even uh, like feasible to proof check. And they, as an example, uh, Facebook ad adopted our protocol in their blockchain platform. They derived their own variant called uh, Libra, or now called DM BFT. It also contains an instantiation of the pacemaker concept, so which is exactly what it, we expected. So they, ha uh, based on their own product, they have their own uh, optimization and own policy of, of rotating the leader or decide of deciding when to propose a block. So they have their own pacemaker, and at last we have a prototype implementation that is pedagogical and could be used for research. So what we didn't anticipate is uh, Facebook adopted the work and then it got uh, very famous. But deep down inside, I think this protocol is elegant and interesting by itself. Uh, and also we've heard rumors or uh, news about the political obstacle that uh, Novi or DM uh, had, uh, is, is going through. So here I just sincerely wish them the best of luck <laughs> for their launch. So uh, after the first word, let's take a brief pause to think about a question. What prevents quorum-based consensus from scaling? Because even in hot stuff, there is a leader, and there is, of course, leader bottleneck. And same you know, for other non-BFT protocols like Paxos. Well, uh, what I can think of uh, right now is there are mainly two reasons. The first reason is the strong consistency requirement by the standard uh, state machine replication model itself. Because in standard state ma machine replication, all the replicas, like showing the diagram, they want to co collab uh, collaboratively write into one consistent log, which is not scalable if intuitively, if you think about it. It's like in a, in a classroom, you want all students to grab one pen to write down the next entry in the log. So, one way to, re, uh, to resolve this issue, if you have a lot of replicas, is to adjust the model. Like, you can weaken the model because there are many applications that do not require total ordering. And the first, I think the first uh, noticeable attempt in the consensus world was made by egalitarian Paxos back in 2013. So there, they argued that the transactions may, the ordering of transaction may may not <clears throat> matter at all, and you, you can just reorder the transactions that do not conflict with each other, and thus creates more concurrency. They call it, there's more consensus in the egalitarian world or, or some sort, they, they have that kind of title, and that's very interesting. And the other major reason is, for all the quorum-based protocols we've, we've currently seen, uh, at least some node, or just one node, has to exchange mess messages to the vast majority of others. This, is, this sounds like uh, inevitable because if you think about it, in your network, you want to make a consensus, you want all correct nodes to participate in the process of making the consensus, then you have to consider the opinions from the entire set. And is that really the case? Well, it's not that quite true. So if you think about an analogy in politics, 
say in the US, we have a Congress, and there are 100 senators in the Congress, plus more than 400 representat uh, representative in the House. And usually a bill has to be passed by uh, both parts. Uh, and, and usually you require simple majority or super majority, very similar to quorum based consensus. But if you ask yourself whether the Congress mode is largely scalable, it's of course not. You cannot include every American in this US Congress. It will be a chaotic state and the efficiency could be very low. But however, in real world, we do seem to have some degree of consensus on social media, if you think about it. Uh, from the st statistics, there are over 200 mil million users on social media in the US. So that means once a news or a rumor comes out, magically somehow there is a tendency that the majority of the crowd moves towards one preface, like, oh, the rumor is fake, or the rumor, uh, the rumor is authentic. So we are actually interested in that. So could we have a loosely organized consensus with some probabilistic kind of safety guarantee. So we do not have to be as secure or as deterministic as the US Congress. We can go for the social media route. Yes, uh, there's a way. So we can do peer-to-peer -peer gossip in the BFT pro uh, environment by sampling that. Of course, this is not a free launch. This is not like, well, we can achieve the same level of democracy using social media as we would with uh, US Congress. But it's like, you know, it's like Bitcoin kind of trade-off. We trade off deterministic safety for a probabilistic one. As long as we are able to make the probabilistic failure probability arbitrarily low. And of course, by gossiping, you already assume it requires more synchrony in the network. But not as, as strong as in those lockstep protocols, because when you gossip in the network, you don't do you know, round one, round two, because the network is very large and it's hard to coordinate everyone. So uh, in, the, in the first graph, we can see the failure probability that goes up with the percentage of Byzantine nodes uh, goes, goes up to 50%. Uh, 50, uh, 50 and for Bitcoin, at 50%, it, it is the exact point where it breaks down. So that's like 50, no one has 51% attack. Uh, for classical protocols, usually it requires three of plus one um, participants to tolerate F failures. So once you go over that uh, one third threshold, immediately, uh, the protocol immediately collapses. But otherwise, the protocol never fails. For our protocol, it's more like a through smooth threshold function that combines the property from both Bitcoin and classical protocols. If we take a closer look at it, by log scaling the y-axis, we can see uh, by configuring the protocol carefully, we can achieve better safety uh, than Bitcoin, six block rule, and, much, and also much faster according to the evaluation results that I show later. So it looks like the entire logic is, is by adding a, a feedback loop. So we, we sample the network, we gossip, we adjust our preference, and we sample again, we adjust it again. And by keep doing that, we hope that we can do a positive feedback in the network. So the binary consensus will topple over to one side, to one color, or zero or one, once the, min, uh, the balance is hard to, to maintain. And indeed, in our protocol, we, do, we did see this uh, characteristic. So in short, it's like, rather than asking everyone about their preference or opinion on something, we just take a constant size sample dependent on the safety parameter you would like to choose. And because the K is pretty scalable, it's only dependent on your safety choice. The, no matter how large the N grows, the choice of K can still stay very small. And as, as an example here, say we have a bunch of circles representing nodes or participants in the protocol, they currently have their preference for one color. And say Alice sampled other five nodes and realized blue might be the majority answer. And at the same time, Bob may sample five other nodes and thinks yellow is the majority answer. 
So for now, they could flip their collar to the opposite side, but such process cannot be maintained indefinitely. So the property here is, if you design the protocol carefully, then you can create a positive feedback loop. So once the balance is off by a bit, either because of the network fluctuation or the initial preference, the entire network will quickly converges towards one value. So in our first BFT protocol called Snowflake, we have a, a loop that samples k peers uniformly at random. And if the majority agrees on the color, and the color is, stays the same as the previously seen color, we increase the counter. Otherwise, we change the color and reset the counter. But this is not ideal, because then the memory for each node is ephemeral. It's like uh, once I see a majority vote now from the network, if it is the color doesn't agree with my current color of preference, I immediately give up my pre preference and yield to the new color. So to counter that uh, in liveness, we added the notion of confidence. So we increase the, we tally and increase the confidence for each color. And our current uh, preference is de defined upon the distribution of the confidence. We only prefer the color that's with the highest confidence. And the rest of the protocol is very similar. So there's a demo. We can, we can play with the demo later at some point, because that saves time. <laughs> but there's a de demo showing the dynamics of the second protocol, Snowball protocol. So we have a protocol that seems to do a binary consensus. Decide, uh, seems to decide between two values and uh, with probability safety uh, guarantee. But uh, what now? Because we want to have a usable system. Say we would like to build something similar to Bitcoin. We'd like to have a decentralized payment system. Then the question is how do you move from that binary protocol to an actual system? So the key observation here is standard replication is not necessary in, a, in realizing a decentralized payment because uh, Bitcoin white paper already uh, proposed a model called unspent transaction output model, which already ensures a verifiable flow of spending by using digital signatures. Then the only missing piece of the, the whole story is how to resolve the conflicts between the transactions to reject those uh, transactions that does not obey the standard model. So here's an example. In this diagram, we have three transactions, A, B, and C. And on the, on the left-hand side of the transaction C, you can see there are two proofs. So the proofs are, could be signatures showing that the creator of C has the ability to spend the unspent output from transaction A and B. And the entire structure, it's like a flow of cash. So basically, you go from left to right, you can see uh, the output, the, the, the spendable part of A is fully consumed by transactions, transaction C. And the spendable, spendable part of B is fully consumed. The first spendable part is consumed by transa transaction C. And there's still one unspent output left. And there are also out unspent output left for transaction C. The unspent parts are usually called balances in, uh, for the you know, virtual accounts in such a uh, decentralized system. And the model is called unspent transaction outputs model. So what we, what we would like to achieve here is suppose there is another transaction called D. And D try also tries to set spend the same unspent output from A. And maybe the owner of the uh, unspent output of transaction A is able to create these two transactions at the same time. Because why not? I can create two proofs that proves the validity of spending the same output. Then things get a little bit complicated because we have to choose between D and C because only one can really one can go through. Otherwise, you will make some money out of thing here. And anyone can just uh, claim that I'm spending that already spent output to always get more money. So 
the resolution here requires something weaker than consensus. By weaker, I mean because for an honest spender, uh, he or she never creates such transaction extra transaction D. Because creating this transaction is pretty deliberate. Uh, imagine this it's a system where each node checks the confliction of the transactions. Then in order to do that, your program has to generate two conflicting transactions and submit them to two different nodes in the network and hope that the majority of the network receives these two transactions in time to have the confliction. So it's a very deliberate process. This is why in our work we justify that for such malicious spender who tries to double spend the unspent output, he, may, he or she may just get stuck forever. We don't care. So then it has weaker liveness compared to the consensus problem. And for, as for the honest case, so I'm an honest uh, spender, I never do this thing, then my transaction is the only choice in such conflict resolution, then that's like a triviality case in consensus, which could be largely optimized. So here uh, it shows we have different sets of conflicts, like these three transactions are conflicting, these two are conflicting, and uh, this is uh, like honest, so I don't create any conflicting transaction to that. What, what I can do in addition to having multiple instances of binary consensus to have the resolution is to chain them up together to better utilize the voting mechanism. So here, suppose I vote for T8 because it is the only preferred one in the set. Then I also cascadingly vote for T4, T2, and all the way to T1. And this just shows a very uh, simplified example because in reality, the tra transaction could contain more than one input, just like I showed in the first diagram. And the problem is, if transaction A conflicts with transaction B, and B conflicts with C, it is not guaranteed that A must conflict with C because they can have different inputs. And their input, it is their inputs that conflict. So to account for that uh, correctly, we are doing the consensus instances at the, really at the transaction input level. And here we go, we have the uh, payment system because we can repeatedly use the binary snowball, a uh, snowball instances and try to generate it to multiple multiple colors. It's not like the deciding among two values, but multiple values. And that for sure will create some lightness issue, but we don't care because the honest spender will only create one value in the consensus process. So then uh, here comes the evaluation. We have evaluated the system uh, in a data, local data center uh, from 100 up to 2,000 nodes. And the two bars represent the throughput uh, with and uh, without signature verification for the transaction. Because when you provide proof, you, you want to do a signature. And uh, as we can see, it scales pretty well. Uh, you can barely notice the performance degradation as the number of nodes doubles. As for latency, uh, latency is also surprisingly well. And by the way, the protocol was configured to be much, much better than Bitcoin in terms of safety. So it's like 10 to the minus, I think, 10 or 9 of failure probability, given, I think, around 10% to 20% of Byzantine nodes uh, in the network. So it's kind of unfair, but you get the point. It is possible to have such protocol, which is way faster than Bitcoin, without doing proof of work and scales very well. And latency here, the majority lies at uh, sub second, and the maximum latency is also sub second. So we're more interested in a geo replicated scenario because that's more realistic. Suppose we distribute these 2,000 nodes in 20 cities across the world and all nodes directly participate in the consensus in the, in, the, in the process that I just talked about. And we also assume full signature verification. So it's a, a very realistic system. Then the results again are very promising. So we can achieve thousands of transactions per second and to have uh, only around one second of a latency. And the maximum latency is around four seconds. So to conclude, 
in this work, we actually first introduced an interesting family of binary B BFT protocols uh, called the SNOW family, uh, which is uh, which is consensus by sampling, so it introduces a new paradigm and perspective of how to do consensus by changing the consensus uh, assumption a little bit. And th this family is quiescent and green, just like those problem-based systems, because they also vote. However, they have probabilistic safety, so they, are, they could be loosely organized like Nakamoto's uh, consensus, and they also incur less communication costs. And that leads to the scalability. And all, it's all thanks to the use of sampling in the product. And on the other hand, we also build a prototype implementation for Avalanche system, a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer payment system. It com combines multi-value snowball instances uh, with the help of UTXL model to allow a fully functional payment system. And this, this, this system has already been commercialized and the deployed worldwide with around 1,000 of validators. So what we didn't anticipate again is uh, the Avalanche system actually, we built a, a startup around this work and the current system is up and running since last September. And in the, in the system is carrying a circulating a pro, a, a supply that's uh, in like two billion dollars worth of uh, equivalent US dollars. And you can see uh, somebody built a nice map showing the distribution of the node running this protocol. And there are around 1,000, like 970-ish when I take the picture. picture, And the volume is, is very decent <laughs> from my perspective it's to show that this system is actually used by many users from the world. And here is a screenshot of the block explorer. And, and this shows the, the real world transactions uh, under the UTX model model. You can see there are inputs and outputs. So it's taking one input and generating two outputs. The Avalanche system is named X chain of the pl platform, which is the main uh, part of the platform. So, uh, and for the f it, is, uh, it is all about the first two works and uh, for, for now, for this minute, I want to take a break and uh, take a further step back and think about, uh, you know, about optimizing or scaling the blockchain infrastructure as a whole thing because we managed to optimize the protocols. We actually offered two solutions, two very different and interesting solutions. but. Once we, oops, <laughs> but can you mute okay. But once we have the solution, the next question would be, uh, what, what, uh, what, where else could the bottleneck actually be? Because you know, when you have a system, when, once you fix one bottleneck, there could be other bottleneck emerging. So uh, my opinion for this is the state machine itself might be the next bottleneck because replication could be made even faster than uh, typical so-called EVM implementation on the market. So then we're diving into the replica itself, the state machine, the state itself. One immediate problem is the storage problem based on our current ongoing research experience. So then uh, we did uh, totally different kind of work. It's not about replication. Forget about the BFT stuff. Forget about voting. All of this, uh, all of these things for now. So we're talking about a storage system called Cedrus DB. So we had three main observations before we set out for this journey. The first observation is uh, there have been many on-disk indexing schemes and usually these are the commonly used uh, schemes for open source or commercial key value stores. And one commonly used data structure is uh, based on B or B plus tree. So this kind of data structure, I believe everyone has learned about balanced binary search tree at some point in their career. <clears throat> and these trees are stable. They have predictable degradation. So when you insert more items into the tree, 
its height increases logarithmically. There's no surprise in the process. <clears throat> it has, uh, they have non-sequential small rights, however, because in order to maintain the tree structure, you may need to amend the tree nodes here and there, inducing non-sequential rights to the underlying uh, persistent storage, like your hard drive. And also tree balance maintenance creates some extra amplification in the process. So you want to balance the tree, in B plus tree, you want to move, like borrow the children from the uh, sibling subtree, and that could also induce some amplification. Another approach, uh, which became very popular recently, is lock stru uh, structured merge tree solutions, or LSM solutions, and <coughs> exemplified by LevelDB and RocksDB. So they are optimized for write-intensive workloads because they generate sequential writes, and the storage, final storage out outcome is compact. But they also have their own deficiency. They are not perfect. For example, they have periodic merge sorted compaction. So that's part of their rebalancing or like adjustment part. But it's very different from the, the, the B tree based solution. So periodically, you will see a huge performance degradation because. Uh, some data are read from a read from a disk into the memory and getting fully sorted, combined and uh, written back to the disk. So that that induces a lot of uh, amplification. It, they also have higher read amplification. So for both uh, solutions under the uh, on this indexing scheme, they were intended for a scenario uh, where data cannot largely or entirely fit into the memory and the secondary storage is much slower than the main memory. And nowadays, because of the advancement in you know, both hardware and uh, data structure, and also like the improvement of not only the secondary storage, but the capacity of the main memory, uh, neither of these two assumptions may hold for some cases. And in the meanwhile, the second observation is we notice yeah, also recently, there are some log or slab based solutions which do not do any on desk indexing at all because organizing the, uh, in indexes or data structure on disk is very expensive. So they instead uh, took another a very different approach. They use fast in, in memory in indexing, which means they can use hash table, some not so storage friendly data structure to keep track of the data and they record all writes to a log. And when you want to use the Kiva store after the failure or after you shut it down, you have to either replay, play back all the changes uh, to the uh, initial image of the uh, Kiva store, or you have to periodically take checkpoints of the entire storage. So the recovery time can be very expensive. That's uh, its deficiency, main deficiency. So. Uh, and based on the, the <clears throat> and, and the third observation is many applications do not require the sorted property. So uh, when, whenever we use a key value store, we usually just pretend it is like a persistent on disk kind of unordered map in C++. So we just uh, input a key and a value to store it and then input a key to retrieve the corresponding value. But in my opinion, according to my experience, many applications that just manage user configurations do not care about the ordering of the keys. Uh, neither does uh, some cl cloud infrastructure care about the, uh, the, the ordering of the keys. And of course, blockchain systems do not care for most of the time because uh, their keys are just hashes already, so they don't care about the ordering. Based on all these ob observations, we propose a new data structure called lazy tree, or tri uh, depending <laughs> depend on how you pronounce it. It is a data structure that is uh, a memory index, but at the same time also storage friendly, meaning it can be directly maintained on the disk. So that way, we can achieve both a comparable performance to the state-of-the-art log-based approach, like faster, while at the same time maintain a fast recovery speed, like RocksDB. So the data structure is actually very simple. 
If you think about how to uh, do a hash kind of tree, you will get it. You can hash the user key into a fixed length of uh, characters or bytes. Then you partition the fixed length bytes into several chunks and use that as indexes into the different level of a radix tree. So the property for this basic structure, which is you know, kind, of, kind of trivial to, in some sense, is it has logarithmic tree height. And it also has no almost no collision if the chosen hash function is strong enough. But of course, that structure is not practical. For example, uh, if you take a closer look at the tree structure, you will notice that for any two keys, since you already use a very strong hash function, it's very unlikely for them to share a long prefix. Um, so that you will see this kind of structure. Like in, on the left, you will see two keys having large part of the path as a singly linked chain. So based on this statistical property, we can just do a path compression for the suffix of a path to shrink this whole structure into the right structure. But that doesn't solve the entire issue. Um, the problem is on uh, the radix tree kind of solution, uh, has a dilemma that if you choose each tree node to be very small, say you only do a Patricia tree, which is a binary radix tree, it could be very tall. So that means you ha have to do a lot of disk IOs. But on the other hand, if you have a fat enough radix tree, of course your tree height is greatly reduced, but each tree node footprint is very large. So that it, the foot, tree footprint could be even larger than the data set your story, which is kind of bizarre. For example, here, suppose we have a 128-way la lazy tree, the, uh, the rudimentary kind of version. The solid blue line, so the, the circle over here, shows uh, an example of having user data uh, footprint for 23-byte keys and 128-byte values, which is small, uh, a, a set of small data, 100 million small data. In order to store that, you have to have way higher storage footprint that's just for metadata to keep track of this user data. And the reason behind is the low utilization of each tree node. And the periodic change here is because of the increase of tree height. You can see it corresponds to the increase of the tree height, average path length, to be more exact in this case. So then we had a very uh, simple and interesting solution. Sorry, to, 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 what is the point your S in those graphs? Oh, sorry. So, so the S, uh, so we're looking at S equals one case. So that's <laughs> without the, uh, the optimization I'm going to talk about in the next slide. So is, is S the log of the branching factor of the? No, no, it's like an introduced parameter <laughs> in, the, in the next slide. Oh, okay. Yeah, sorry for that confusion. So, then we introduce some notion called sluggishness, or S, in the, in the graph. So the, the principle for sluggishness is, suppose we don't have any sluggishness, like what we did for in, the, in the previous slide. We will have, we'll end up with a path compressed a tree structure like this. So all the leaves are data nodes, and you have some interior tree nodes, but each tree node could have thousands or hundreds or thousands of children which consume a lot of storage uh, overhead. So what we do instead is to lazily expand this tree. So instead of doing this all at once, we have a systematic way, which is to allow some uh, overflowing data uh, items under one, ch uh, one child. So in B example, if we look at this structure, if we allow S equals three, then we can have D0 and D1 all under uh, this child to form a list, and D3, 4, 5 under this child to have another list. And whenever we insert an extra uh, child or extra item in, down this child, like D6, it overflows our upper limit, like S equals 3, so we have to redistribute the whole list by introducing a new tree level to split it. So then we have the final structure in graph C. If you compare graph C to graph A, it still has two 
like uh, it only has three three nodes in total, like th two less than the, the in the graph of A. So it actually saved around roughly uh, like 50% or ish of uh, tree footprint storage. And by doing that, if we say use sluggishness of four, what we can do here is for the previous example of having 100 million items, uh, that's, that corresponds to around 21 gigabytes of uh, entire user data set. And we only need to spend two gigabytes for the tree structure instead of 31 gigabytes. So it's a simple uh, but a very interesting, elegant optimization that makes the whole structure practical. And apart from the lazy tree data structure, we also have a pressure. So how do you store this thing based on the previous slide? Is it in the same node or like right. How does this increase the in the slug machines uh, store down say this? Oh, so uh, the the sluggishness is like a global parameter for the Kiva store. Yeah. So, like for example, here I just I just have a data store that allows sluggishness of three. So that's the increase of uh, three items. Right? Yeah. So whenever you have the fourth item, you got you have to split the list further by introducing. But how it. many disk do you need for this uh, list of three? Oh, it's a uh, yeah, good question. So the overhead of splitting, because we introduced an uh, additional operation here, the overhead of uh, splitting is negligible in practice because the frequency of slipping, sl slipping is, is splitting <laughs> is very low. Uh, because of the hash function, the, the, the statistical property of the tree. I think we're going in the last five minutes of your sure talk. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, you, you can choose whether you want to leave time out <laughs> for yeah, questions yeah, or not. Yeah, I'll talk about, uh, it, it's, it's around the end. <laughs> it's around the end. So, on, uh, apart from, in addition to the, uh, the data structure, we also have a uh, uh, interesting system design for it, but of course due to the time limit, I'm not going to explain the uh, engineering details uh, in this talk, but there's an overall architecture look of the system. So we have, we divide the storage space, linear space, into pages, uh, and uh, group pages into the, uh, to the granularity of a region. And we then group several regions um, into individual files and all by looking at different bits. It's like a page table style kind of division in this space. And then we map, we do memory map because our data structure is both uh, in, in memory and storage friendly. So we can directly memory map the region into the memory. And when, whenever you make changes to the, uh, the pages, you have you create dirty pages, uh, put into the right buffer. You can have batch writes. You, there's some uh, basic level of concurrency control. Uh, to utilize some concurrency in this data structure because Radix tree has a lot of potential in con concurrency. And there's a separate disk thread that first write ahead the log and then schedule the block writes using asynchronous Linux I.O. So this is the overall sketch of the implementation. And overall the evaluation results are very promising. Uh, we only, <laughs> due to the time limit, we can look at the, the, the graph on the left, we can see for read intensive loads, like from 90% reads to 100% pure reads, uh, for four threads, our uh, Kivao store outperform other main competitors. And for more write intensive ones, of course, uh, faster, which is a uh, log based uh, approach, is definitely faster than <laughs> anyone else. But in, even in this case, we achieve comparable or uh, superior. Uh, write intensive performance compared to other uh, on disk indexing schemes because we are on disk indexing schemes. And here is the uh, scalability with respect to the number of threads. And there I is indeed some bottlenecks in our implementation, and we identify them, we talked about them in, in the paper, but overall the trend looks very promising. So, like if you check faster here. Like we, although, although we saturate over here, it's still comparable 
when you have uh, ex excessive amount of threats in this case. And as for recovery, so this is the ultimate table. So we have the normal throughput for the given write intensive workload, which is 58 percent updates. Uh, we are always this index, we are like faster, we are hash matched, so we, we don't preserve the order for user keys. But our recovery time is close to other in disk index solutions, whereas we are cheap throughput comparable to fast and Covell. Covell is a slab based solution. And the other ones like Mastery uh, achieves very high throughput, but you know you have to create either checkpoint you ha or you have to suffer a very long, uh, suffer from a very long recovery time. So that's it. Uh, the conclusion for this part is uh, we propose a lazy tree data structure. It is friendly to impose in memory on on disk axis. It dynamically, dynamically grows with neo optimal tree height. It's also efficient in concurrent access. We designed and implemented the full Kivala store. Uh, it, it could be made uh, available, but we will pl we'll plan to open source it later, uh, very soon. So it's ready to use Rust Crate. Can be used. It has C and Go language bindings. And also, I, I separate right head logging to form a basic library, so it could be used for future research purposes. And uh, that's it. So uh, I would like to leave some final remarks, uh, if I'm not over time. But in short, it's like many researchers, like including me and uh, other collaborators, uh, have the feeling that you know consensus research is converging slowly. Uh, it's hard to do new things in this area, but I'd say you know it's like twofold. On the one hand, yes, it is. It's hard to do groundbreaking new research projects. But on the other hand, it's a good thing for the industry because you have to wrap it up in order to move on. So if you look from the wider perspective, if you look at the entire blockchain system, it's not only about consensus, but where consensus gets involved. So it has something to do with state machine, it has something to do with the execution of the operations on the state, state machine and the storage. So I envision that the next main bottleneck for such blockchain infrastructure is within the state machine. The storage to preserve the state and the execution. And there's also um, many things to do there. And of course, in some relation to the consensus, because uh, it's good to treat them as black, black boxes, but sometimes you would want some more optimization. It is better to have knowledge for each part so you can integrate them better. And to conclude, my PhD journey started with uncertainty, went down with surprises, and finally finished up with joy and fulfillment, hopefully, after the results come out. <laughs> and uh, I see myself both as a researcher and engineer, uh, but more of a bridging role that grows theory with practice. Location or position does not affect my continuing effort in doing research. So I'm definitely looking for a future collaboration the, this big exam really changes my uh, career trajectory. And at last, I'd like to say there are too few blockchain system researchers, to be honest. So most of the researchers are either in crypto security or secure, uh, theory. And the importance of building decentralized infrastructure is largely undervalued by the system of Ethereum. And that could probably explain why the lab lunch paper is still rejected now. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for listening. Thank you for attending my video. <laughs>
I'm, so I'm asking because I heard that, for example, in Bitcoin, there are like a, a, a large majority of resources but controlled by a very small number of parties. Yeah, that, that's a very <laughs> insightful question. So, can uh, we get the full question? So, yeah, sure. Oh, so, oh, uh, uh, basically, my question is uh, whether that uh, power law is uh, will play a role when it's playing that figure. Okay. So, so at a time of when we drew that graph, we also had the question because in our mind, because uh, strictly speaking, when we talk about fault tolerance of Bitcoin or Nakamoto consensus, we're talking in terms of computational power. We're not talking about the identities. But there, in the graph, we just mix them, to mix them together because they look similar. So in reality, of course, uh, like if you own the like supercomputer uh, of, of multiple labs in the U.S., then you can overthrow Bitcoin, and you only probably just possess one identity. So there, the graph more or less just shows for that particular protocol in its own like assumption, the model, the portion of uh, adversaries in the network. So for Bitcoin, it's like the, the power, the computational power. But for other protocols, because they don't require that power, they just need an identity, it's either done by some admission rule, like, like in this room, I invited everyone, but you know, random, uh, random people cannot come to this talk, so you can do that, it's by admission, uh, it's, uh, sorry, it's by administration, or permission system. Or you can do permissionless, uh, with some similar argument to Bitcoin. You can do proof of stake. So everyone who participate has to stake in at least this amount of money. So uh, it's a little bit the same thing, but uh, good question. Thank you. Any other questions yet? Uh, I, did not get, I did not fully get a connection between the Citrus DB and, and blockchain. Why is Citrus DB particularly good for storing blockchain? Oh, that, <laughs> that's a decent part of the entire story. So, First of all, the hash tree or the lazy tree or tree structure was inspired. I forgot to say it's actually inspired by the Merkle Patricia tree in uh, blockchains. In blockchains, you use some Merkle trees to prove that uh, some item belongs to a set. So we, when we, when we did before we did the research, we were using some uh, existing solution like Level DB in Avalanche. Uh, when I code up the the prototype I used, I had to use a database, but I soon noticed that for commodity level storage hardware, the uh, the performance is, n is not scalable due to the compaction. So then we set out for 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 uh, for finding a better keyless store for blockchain. But later we realized that you know this keyless store is could could also be used as a generic keyless store. So that's why you find that the tone is kind of you know separate from the first one but you can also use it as a as a uh, blockchain key value store so it just means like i'm trying out a new thing that could also contribute to the uh, blockchain infrastructure because as i said state machine storage is also a huge bottleneck an online question from dahlia did you compare cedars db with trillion trillion I'm not uh, familiar with it either. <laughs> I'm not familiar with it either, sorry. Okay. Yeah, we, we, we can so do the, the comparison. No. Can do the, no. <laughs> uh, quick answer is no, but uh, we'd like to know more about that and uh, do the comparison. Other questions? In or out? Okay, well, in that case, uh, let's do one more round of applause. for coming online and, and in line <laughs> and uh, so uh, I said this uh, I so unfortunately for online